the, the more subtle form of that tradition, uh, which pleases me tonight, is that the proposer is supposed to be more positive than the seconder. I don't yet know who the seconder is, so I don't, and I don't know what their views in the papers, but it seems to me visualization self-evidently is important, uh, and the opportunities for uh, doing more sophisticated visualizations are, you know, they're ever growing. Um, I, I think it's worth thinking about what you're using visualizations for, uh, and I think, uh, I would say that the focus of the papers that we've uh, heard so far are very much on the fact that it's, it's about exploring data, it's about checking the assumptions that you make when you're analyzing data, and it's about communicating results. Um, what I didn't hear any of the speakers say was to whom they were trying to communicate, and I think that does have a bearing on, on what sort of visualizations you use. And, and I absolutely don't want to be a Luddite, and I'm not accusing the speakers of doing this, but I think with visualizations, and I mean, perhaps I'm accusing Adrian's brother of this, is that beauty is beguiling, but beauty doesn't necessarily uh, convey the information uh, optimally that you want to convey. So uh, the risk of really um, uh, lowering the tone of the discussion far, to, far to, to the beyond the elementary in the downside, uh, don't forget the simple things. So this is an example I think goes back to uh, Bill Cleveland's uh, book on graphical elements, uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, one of our old favorites, the sunspot data. And I, I, I've plotted the sunspot data here as, as annual sunspot numbers, and I deliberately chose the graph that R put up for me by default when I just asked it to plot the data. And, and of course, what it tells us uh, is that we can see ups and downs, and we can see how big the ups and downs are. The more subtle feature of, of, of the sunspot data is completely lost by that choice of aspect ratio. And the, the feature that's, I think, if you look at it for, you know, more than a millisecond, certainly, but not too long, you can see that most of the cycles in the sunspot data have a pronounced asymmetry. Uh, and that's, that's basically simply the visual um, perception that you get by changing the aspect ratio radically. Now, we're, we don't have to be a slave to A4 pieces of paper or the aspect ratio of our screen, but there is a... I'm, I am surprised how many times I see otherwise brilliant students producing default graphs without worrying about the aspect ratio. Well, that's extraordinary elementary comment, but uh, let's now move on to a map. Now, another thing that pleased me personally, but I don't think it's a coincidence, is that all three of the talks, um, to some extent, were about spatial data analysis. And, and I don't think that's a complete coincidence, because a map is a very powerful visual metaphor and has been for centuries. And maps are fundamentally, I think, attractive objects, and people probably overinterpret them when they're statistical maps, because in our everyday lives, we're used to reading maps which convey a truth, whereas statistical maps, at best, give us a guess at the truth. And what I'm showing you here is what would now be considered a very standard graphical presentation of a set of geospatial data, in this case, this is one of many countries in Africa uh, for, uh, within which uh, myself and my colleague Emanuela Giorgi, who's in the room, uh, were asked to analyze with a view to building a prevalence map of a really rather serious public health condition uh, that ravages, or thankfully less than it used to, but is, it's prevalent throughout sub-Saharan Africa called onchocerciasis, or more commonly known as a river blindness. And th this uh, example for Liberia shows you very clearly, I think, that if, if this is our best guess at prevalence, we're, we're showing the data, size and color-coded, so there's some redundancy there, but I think redundancy in visualization is often quite a good idea, because some people respond to colors, some people can't even see them, never mind, don't like them. Uh, and so the cue here in the data is that both color and size is telling you about the data value. But what's overlaid in, in a continuous color scale is a point prediction of the prevalence at each point in Liberia. And, I, I, you know, I think that's quite a pretty map. The colors may be too bright for Adrian's taste, but I think it's quite a nice map. There are some obvious features to it, which is that prevalence increases as you move away from the coast, uh, but not in a deterministic manner. And there are many good reasons why, if you understand the entomology and the epidemiology of river blindness, uh, why that happens. But I actually want to be very critical of this map, because this map doesn't actually answer any question that's of remote interest to anybody, right? The only reason these data were collected was because 
an Africa continent-wide program of mass distribution of preventive medication to protect people against this disease had a major operational research problem, which is that there's not a lot of money in sub-Saharan Africa for doing mass treatment of the population. And so you had to prioritize which areas were really in need of treatment because the state of the disease locally was um, high enough to be of public health concern, okay? And a lot of people using non-statistical arguments decided that basically what we really need to know is where are we sure, in inverted commas, that the prevalence is large enough to be deemed a public health priority. So if I show you my next map, what that is, is a predictive probability map. And the predictive probability map, unlike, unlike the point prediction of prevalence, actually answers a specific question. Namely, is prevalence, or is it not, in excess of 0.1, 10%? And if you uh, find that at any point on this map, that predictive probability is, to all intents and purposes, one, i.e. bright green, then that's a perfect prediction for that very specific question, right? It's not precise for any question, and the prevalence estimate is highly imprecise. But the one thing we can be sure of is that through most of Liberia, uh, the prevalence is greater than one, the exceptions being near the coast. And then, of course, you can just ramp through, okay? And being a, an old person of very little brain, I, my, my animations are manual at this point. Um, <laughs> You can see that as you get up to uh, higher prevalences, you know what happens qualitatively, but you quantify it. And you can also look at the residual anomalies uh, that don't quite follow the coast to away from the coast trend. And these predictive probabilities are automatically adjusting for the fact that the data are more sparse in some countries, as parts of the country, that, than others. Whereas a map of the data alone, people tend to be beguiled by the data into thinking they're the truth. Data are never the truth. Data are a, an imperfect mirror on the truth. Uh, now, for better or for worse, the agreed policy for prioritization of treatment uh, in this case was convincing evidence that the prevalence is greater than 20%. So from Liberia's point of view, that means that, you know, there's quite a lot of Liberia that is a public health priority. Now, if you have to weigh that against resources, you may have to reluctantly say that really we're going to have to make it a more stringent criterion and you can hone in on uh, this little area. You can see the hotspot in particular in the middle of the country and then the, the other hotspots near the border, and, and that's where your priority is. So that's answering an operational question. So I said, who are we doing graphics for? Well, I think in a lot of our own work, of course, we're doing visualizations to communicate to ourselves and our peers, to fellow statisticians. These maps I've found are very effective when you're trying to communicate with decision makers. And these decision makers have to make a decision each year where are we going to go to distribute the medication? And they debate, you know, what the threshold should be for high priority for intervention. But our job as statisticians, I think, is not to tell them what to do, but to tell them, based on your criterion, which defines a specific question, I can say, you really should do this, you really shouldn't do that, and I honestly don't know what you should do where the predictive probability isn't close to zero or one. So that's communicating with decision makers. The other thing I'd like to show you is an experience, that was just in case the animation didn't work, a uh, set of three slides. The other thing I want to show you is how we've used these things in communicating with um, the general public, and the general public here being inhabitants of the Jikwawa uh, district in southern Malawi. And so this is an animation built by Emanuela Giorgi, uh, which simply shows the monthly prevalence map for an area of southern Malawi. And the point about this is that, that we, we took these maps and we, we showed them to health workers and uh, village, key village people uh, saying, you know, this is the royal we. I haven't personally uh, been involved in, in, in the program. I, I'm much more the statistician along with Emanuela who, who do the analysis. But the, the research team has been out working with the communities trying to reduce the, the problem of, of uh, malaria prevalence in these data. And basically, if you... Uh, look at May 2013, you can see that there's one area of this district to the east where the prevalence is pretty much certainly greater than 20%, and for the rest of the area, it's considerably less. Now, if you backtrack to the beginning of the animation, that simply showing people that immediately, that they, they get it. The, the, the community intervention, the community action has radically transformed the malaria experience in this country. So, scientifically, there's nothing here that's at all um, 
fancy. It's just a set of predictive probability maps. But the message it gives to the community and to the, and, and is really, I think, a very powerful one. And I think that does come back primarily to the power of the visual metaphor that maps provide. So um, I'm pleased because of my personal bias that, that spatial problems have figured prominently in all three talks. I'm hugely impressed by, by the, 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 the technical skills that, that are shown both in thinking imaginatively about the methods uh, and the hardware and software that implements the methods. But I do think it, it's, it's something you'll hear me say again, that whatever you're doing in a visualization at whatever stage of the analysis, two things you have to think of. One is who is this visualization for? And the second thing is what is the question that this visualization is trying to answer? And just saying, hey, I can produce a nice map isn't, isn't answering a question. Right? You need a map that, that focuses a question. And, you know, I would humbly suggest that what this map very clearly does do is answer a very specific question saying, where, if anywhere, is malaria prevalence greater than 20% in May 2010? And the answer is it's certainly greater than 20% in some places, it certainly isn't in others, and we honestly don't know. And if that question triggers a public health intervention, then you have to grapple with that uncertainty. What people do about it is a difficult problem, but certainly pretending that you can demarcate into a yes, no, is not the right way to do it. Um, I genuinely want to thank the speakers for, for their contributions and uh, the uh, Society for organising meeting on this important topic, uh, and I look forward very much to the rest of the discussion. But thank you, speakers, very much indeed. So um, this is a joint contribution on behalf of my colleague, Mark van der Mullebroek, also at Novartis and myself. And sadly, this is the only visualisation that you'll see. Um, I think this is a really important topic, data visualisation. It's something that's close to my heart. Um, and a common theme running through the three papers is how to visualise uncertainty. And this is probably the biggest challenge for statisticians at the moment. It's kind of similar to looking at a Jackson Pollock, where sometimes you can see some something within the painting, but most of the time it's just noise. Okay. Today I'm just going to focus on two of the three papers. I have to have a disclaimer. Um, Professor Bowman taught me statistics as an undergraduate. I won't say how long ago, but it was over 20 years ago. <laughs> um, another disclaimer, a, a colleague of mine is part of the core STAN team, uh, Sebastian Weber, so potentially I might be very sympathetic to both uh, authors today. Okay, so to start off, um, shading and animation was introduced by Adrian um, into his paper, and we agree that shading has many advantages. It can be an effective channel for encoding uncertainty. So uncertainty is fuzzy, and I think having shading, it really gets us away from the sort of precision that we use with, say, a position, a point, a point estimate, and length, a bar. So typically, that's how we encode uncertainty. If we can move away from that, that's obviously a good thing. Um, this is intuitive and it conveys the appropriate level of fuzziness, this um, idea of shading. It also discourages a focus on point estimates or threshold-based bi binary judgments. So we work in, um, say, drug development and science isn't really a yes-no um, decision-making. Sometimes we're uncertain, sometimes we have the fear, and this is where using different techniques might be something that we should be thinking about. Um, Graphical representations of hypothesis tests, this was introduced in the paper, and I think this is a really interesting idea where uh, what it does is it intuitively conveys the idea of assumption checking. This is something that we don't often see in statistical tests, so I think this is something that, again, encourages good practice. Um, but shading also has drawbacks. Perceptually, um, this is not as precise as the other standard methods. Um, you could argue that this is a feature and not a bug, but it really depends on the question that you're trying to address. Uh, what context are you using this uh, technique? Um, visual perception of intensity may also change depending on what color you select, what color hue you select. And th what I mean by this is the same number, the quantitative number, may change by the different color that you use. We've all seen really badly implemented heat maps this is where, again, news and shading, we have to be very careful. And if you think back to the quote from Tuft on color, the first principle of news and shading may be to do no harm. Um, okay, and I think this is points to another thing about potentially being cautious about news and shading is it could be challenging to implement well. And so um, we could have a series of data scientists or, or, or statisticians that could be using this technique in a very poor way. And, 
Communication visually is not a zero-sum game. If we get it wrong, we can detract from the message. Animation, um, we're more skeptical about. I think it has less advantages. Um, it is an effective uh, uh, technique for displaying changes over space and time, but I would argue not uncertainty. Um, animation is a powerful stimulus that could compete with the message. So if you think about a motion picture where the storyline or the plot is really taken over by the car chases or explosions, etc., you're really missing from the actual um, point or the message you're trying to convey. We feel that animation may be another scenario where it detracts from the key messages that you're trying to point out for your visualization. Animation also introduces an extra dimension, time or evolution, which can often mislead. If time or evolution isn't part of the visualization, isn't part of the data, then what you're doing is introducing a second or third variable that again may mislead. Um, and finally, animation, it forces a pace on the viewer and this is where a viewer may not be able to look at the, the, say to the data visualization at their own pace, at their own leisure to understand it, and that might be a frustrating um, introduction. One final point, and this is really to uh, reiterate what was spoken before is, um, are these techniques really effective at communicating uncertainty? And really, as statisticians, we need to go back to the work of Cleveland and McGill to really understand for a given task when is shading and animation really more effective than the standard techniques that we would use? And I would sort of second this with, by saying, are both techniques more effective than standard methods for communicating uncertainty a more general, wider audience? Are they more effective? We don't have the evidence to, uh, to really understand this yet. Okay, now to talk about this second paper, visualization and Bayesian workflow. Um, this is a workflow for the applied Bayesian. I would argue it's not just a, a workflow for the applied Bayesian. I think this is really a, a, a demonstration of how to do exploratory data analysis and model fitting for any quantitative discipline. Um, I really salute the work. It's, I, I find it is, it's something that's really compelling and really interesting. At the core of this workflow is data visualization. Uh, I think this is really fundamental. This is really important. And this workflow resonates with our experience as statisticians in drug development. Um, this is a visual communication is a, an important competency to master and it's required at all stages from the design of experiments right through to analysis and reporting. And if you don't have a mastery of this visual communication, and I, I don't think you are as effective, say, as a statistician in drug development as you could be. Being able to uh, be useful or effective at visualization also helps in different modes of working from learning to confirming or to the objective to the subjective. These are labels and what I'm really meaning is switching between being a Bayesian or a frequentist, um, looking at exploring your data, trying to determine what are your say estimates to take into a phase three trial and then going into the confirming stage in uh, phase three uh, say clinical studies. Um, have an effective visualization to yourself and to your, your, say, your scientific teams is really fundamental. And this is something that's really not taught well in undergraduate statistics courses, I would argue. Um, in this paper, the authors really demonstrate this competency at each phase of the workflow um, uh, incredibly well, from data exploration, setting up appropriately calibrated priors, diagnostic model checking, and model comparison. Um, it's really a, a great piece of work. I will be critical at some point. <laughs> so, um, one thing I think this paper really demonstrates is it's important to consider who are we communicating to. So in the discussion section, there's a, a discussion around the theoretical and philosophical implications of using the data twice. I think that's a, a, an additional discussion that we can have later. Um, here, it's clear that we are communicating to ourselves as statisticians. And by using effective visualizations, we're able to facilitate the discussion of all the methodological issues that are involved with um, um, using the data twice. And there's also a demonstration of how to ameliorate this uh, type of potential reservation or issue with the workflow through this um, uh, effective visualizations. And what I really like about this paper is it also acknowledges all sources of uncertainty, not just statistical variation alone. So uncertainty about our model fit, or about our data, or about a problem. Um, I think being able to visually understand this and communicate to ourselves as statisticians is a great tool. But there is something missing from this workflow, and that's a demonstration of how to visually communicate the outcome of an analysis, especially for scientific understanding or the decision making. Um, here we're communicating to a general audience, or scientific teams, or the general population at hand. Um, 
This requires simpler gra graphical representations that are intuitive, easy to understand, and communicable. Basically, we're telling stories at this point. And to do this with skill, we still need to master the simple tools that are at our disposal before we move on to more advanced techniques. And with that, I would like to thank all three sets of authors for their really interesting uh, con contributions to data visualization. Thank you. I work in industry, so perhaps I'd like to bring an industry perspective here. As statisticians, we are very much already bought into the idea of visualization. Therefore, we are preaching to the converted. From a wider industry perspective, I see IT functions across the business whose job in life is to warehouse data, look after data, etc. And not once do they visualize it, you know? And from my experience in Shell, I've seen that the value is not perhaps in machine learning or advanced modeling, it's in making the data more accessible bring it together one place and visualizing it, yeah? So perhaps, from a statistical perspective, we as a community have more responsibility to not just think about the advanced techniques to our peers, but also in preaching more basic methodology which provides value to the non-enlightened, shall we say. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, I am focusing on the first talk from Stefano Castruccio. And uh, first of all, I wish to thank the authors, uh, Castruccio, Genton, Sun, for the novelty, the potentiality of uh, this uh, stimulating proposal. Uh, virtual uh, reality-based statistic analysis, it's a promising approach for model diagnostics and from my perspective, especially in uh, the statistical analysis of climate data. And I'm focusing a little bit on this part of uh, the use of virtual reality. I mentioned here virtual observatory from Gaia Klim, a uh, European recent project, uh, just to show you that uh, uh, people from uh, atmospheric science are used to do virtual things. So, uh, here you can see you can see uh, the representation of the data collection uh, with the satellite and uh, ground level. Sorry, I don't have a pointer. Yes, I don't think it's a pointer. No pointer. Okay. Wait, Just, <laughs> you see the, the uh, ground level measure, uh, measurements, the satellite, and the ge geometry of the measurement. Uh, if we have more time, you can go into the YouTube things. Uh, but uh, I go on, and uh, uh, just uh, I want to make clear that I'm going to consider two points. The first point is about similarity index, and uh, uh, it's interesting because uh, one proposal, the similarity index has been proposed by one as maybe 20,000 citations, and, but this is the first time that I see used in statistical context. So thank you for introducing these things in spatiotemporal modeling. And the second point is uh, uh, related to virtual reality uh, uh, environment. The, the authors use it, uh, the virtual reality for three-dimensional global climate data. Uh, I'm wondering about what happens with four-dimensional climate data. So I will spend some slides about this point uh, to uh, tell, give you an example of this. So uh, going uh, with the first um, uh, issue, uh, the uh, similarity index I consider in a special context. So the two variables, the two images, the two signals are a little bit special. We have data Y and the statistical model Y hat for Y. Uh, uh, for example, Y is an image, Y hat is a Kriging estimator. So uh, we can rewrite the, the formula that uh, uh, Stefano showed before in this way. So we have three components. The first is the correlation coefficient. Then we have a standardized uh, bias, squared bias, delta mu is the difference between the averages. And the third component is uh, 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 related to the variation of the standard deviation. So the delta sigma is the difference in standard deviations. In, uh, 
in, in image analysis, these three components are well known. First is structure, then luminance, and then contrast. In a, a statistical context, I prefer to call them linearity, bias, and smoothing or scale. But if we use this uh, in, from a statistical perspective, uh, I prefer a little a small difference, a small variation of this index. The first thing that I would like to put is a square here, because the, the, the second and third elements are squared, but the first one is, is on it. All are relative numbers, but it's not square. The second point is to use an asymmetric version, because y and y hat for this perspective are not on the same ground. And th th these denominators here are smaller than them, so this, this index is more severe than the first one. So I go on fast on the second topic. I skip some slides. Sorry, I don't, yeah. I cannot uh, use the mouse. OK. So what happens with four-dimensional climate data on non-regular grids? Uh, um, Stefano's proposal is related to uh, data on a regular grid. So uh, uh, we have model data which are observed on latitudes and longitudes uh, and on time on a regular grid. Observational data often are on non-regular grid. For example, if we consider radio sonde data set on temperature, uh, you see here the map of the stations. We have uh, about 700 monitoring stations and one year data, two measurements per day. And we have uh, 25 vertical observations. So we have profiles, radio sonde flies, and give measurement. So we have a four dimensional data set, and uh, the dimensionality here is about 12 million points uh, for this, this case. Uh, so to model this, we use uh, uh, I think a four dimensional model, uh, YSTP, S stands for st space, T for time, and P is the pressure level, the altitude. Speed up. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, I go into the conclusion uh, section to uh, say, okay, after, sorry. Uh, we compute uh, a, a Kriging, uh, four dimensional Kriging, and four dimensional Kriging for one year, a full grid is about uh, uh, two billion Kriging computations. So this requires uh, supercomputing capabilities. And uh, in doing this, uh, we have uh, uh, the following points. Uh, virtual reality uh, environment uh, uh, may be the key to the success of this approach. Uh, we need to implement uh, on, uh, say, on a flexible system. So cheap devices and uh, easy to use software. So uh, I think the software problem is very, very important in, the, in this. Uh, and this may be a revolution in, in statistical analysis in general, and in particular in statistical analysis of climate data. Uh, the similarity index uh, is very interesting. Uh, maybe after some little modifications, and uh, in the end, okay, in the end, uh, how to represent four-dimensional model results on a virtual reality? It's just a question. I don't know. Thank you very much, um, uh, Peter and uh, Mark, for saying the things that I was going to do. Um, this, this image here is, was produced by Carol Jagger and Peter Gore. So this is not mine, but Carol assured me that it was in the public domain. I took this as license to, to show it. Uh, to you, but I won't be putting it in the, the, the journal. I don't think that would be um, reasonable. But the issue is about the audience you're communicating to, and actually, we found something in a, a statistical sense. We've actually got an inference that we're confident about. We, we need to, to bite the bullet and say, we're, we're going to try and persuade the audience of um, this. And actually, th this is a bit of a step. It's not just, here's some sort of uh, decision. Actually, we're going to, to, to step a bit further, and this is the issue of communication. 
you have a message to deliver and actually you've got to bite the bullet about this. So this is a, um, a bivariate uh, presentation uh, about health inequality. So you can see the numbers there. Um, sorry, the, the image will be very familiar to people who have lived in Newcastle in the past 30 years and might be quite mysterious to everybody else. And that's <laughs> the point. The audience is the local health commissioners in Newcastle. So you select an image for the audience, and this is a standard presentation, the metro line map. You plot local health inequality on the local transit map. So the numbers are the um, uh, healthy life expectancy at the, for adults aged uh, uh, 55, and it's, it's, I think it's ward level. Uh, and so they've just circled the corresponding station on the local uh, metro map for uh, some of these with, labeled with the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the healthy life expectancy. And of course the other variant there is uh, social deprivation. But of course that's not marked on the map because the audience know where the poor people live. And I, that, that's the point. So they can make the inference about health inequality. They can see the big difference here, the people of Bycliffe sadly retire into ill health, while the people of uh, Pont Heland, where, where the footballers live, have actually 10 healthy years in retirement. They, they, they know what, what the issues are there. But there's a rhetoric here as well. Um, you, can, you, you can see on a transport model how easy it is to travel between these places. They're not different parts of the country. Health inequality isn't north v south, it's actually happening in your area. It, it's, it's your responsibility to do something about that. Um, so there are components here that you actually say, well, you could use a map, but actually there's more geographic detail than you need. This is the level of detail they need. So I was just gonna show you one image and then say, I, I've, I've sort of come up with some principles. I've looked at other people's work on this and they, they all have, various sort of arguments and then some principles. And I thought, well, you know, I, I can do that as well. Um, uh, so to prevent, uh, prevent something multivariate is best because actually if you have a univariate uh, presentation, you just get judgmental about who is good, who is bad. It's a league table, it, however you look at it. Whereas if you um, have more than one dimension, there's a pattern there to think about rather than a judgment of, of what is high and low uh, and what, what, you, what you feel about that. Um, but you present a um, semantic, the message. This is, so I've been working with somebody in communication theory. They, they've explained that you, you break this up into pragmatics, uh, seg uh, semantic, and rhetoric. So the pra pragmatics is like the axes of the graph or something like that. It's not, it's not actually part of the message. It just helps you to know what the, the message means. And the semantic, in our case, is the inference. And you don't write down, this is what it is, this is the p-value or whatever. It's actually so obvious to people that they deduce it. You, you, you make it clear, and actually they can put, put this into um, uh, wh whatever their own understanding is. You don't force your inference on them, that you actually show them that the, the inference is there. Uh, and you actually take out the detail that you don't need. So the geographic detail in maps is often more detailed and actually exaggerates the precision of, of the mapping compared to the other data you have. So actually we don't have that much uh, information, but we know in very great detail uh, the contours of the land and you, you can ag exaggerate that, whereas a, a local transport map does that very well. Um, and then um, they, the, you, oh. they've just got um, to one decimal place. They don't have the uncertainty. Actually, the data supports that, that level of precision, and actually, they sort of skipped that. It's, it's not important. If it was important to the message that the uncertainty was incorporated, then you'd need to have that, but if, as it isn't, you, you wouldn't, uh, and you use their knowledge from this, and um, actually using the metaphors that arise from the presentation to persuade people of the imperative to, to do something about this is actually more important than the objectivity. We had an a priori hypothesis. We can say that all the data supports this local health inequality. Um, actually, 
we're going to step past just being passive about this. We need to convince you that this is the case. It's up to you what you do about it, but actually health inequality is a local issue. Uh, one of my favorite books as a student was John Berger, who was an art critic and artist. Um, and it was called Ways of Seeing. And one of my true loves is art. And as I've been listening to uh, the papers and, and the discussion points afterwards, it's occurred to me that um, two things. First is we can't always assume that everybody sees what we perceive that they will see. So there's uh, a piece of missing um, analysis, I think, in what's been described today in terms of are we all assuming that everybody sees the map in the same way? But secondly, he famously said, uh, he wrote his, his famous book um, called Ways of Seeing in 1972 when I was a student. Um, and he taught us that photographs always need language and require a narrative to make sense. And one of the things I've been thinking about while I've been listening is we can't I don't believe, throw away the narrative. And the data journalism session that I put together and ran yesterday was very much about telling stories with data and getting back to the basics. And I couldn't agree more that if we, if we don't teach people those basic principles, we can't really expect to go into some of the much more advanced work that we've been listening to today. So my plea really is to make sure that as a, a, a community of um, statisticians and data scientists, that we do make sure that the principles are well understood of data graphics or uh, the, the grammar of graphics. I saw a fantastic presentation at a conference in Tokyo earlier this year talking about the grammar of graphics, but really also not to ignore the narrative and the storytelling. And the person who came up and asked the first, uh, made the first discussion point was about different audiences. And my point when I give a presentation is always to ask myself, who is our audience? Tom, you said you talked about the audience being um, decision makers in Newcastle and that graphic uh, was very well known to them, but there always will be different audiences. So whilst I take the point that graphics will be presented with a particular audience in mind, I think we also need to think about our secondary audience, audiences. So my point is twofold. One is about the principles of good graphical design and interpretation, so graphical literacy, if you like. And secondly, please don't forget the narrative and expect an infographic to do all the work for us, because I don't think it can. Thank you. I'd actually like to ask a question of a very august body of people here. In my work, um, in New Zealand, I work with scientists, I design experiments. Some months later, some data arrives on my desk and I do some analysis, which I generally think is of a reasonable quality. I draw some nice graphs, which get sent back to the scientist. And in many cases, they use all of this and they come up with some nice results and we're all very happy. I have a small group of people, though, who, when the paper arrives back on my desk for my review as a draft, have removed all of the graphs that I drew and they've replaced them with Excel bar graphs with a little standard error bar on top, <laughs> a sprinkling of A's and B's and C's as if a slightly drunk spider has wandered across. <laughs> and they can see the message much more clearly in this graph than the one with the five replicates where I actually drew the data because that muddies things because the data was skew and there were a couple of outliers <laughs> and they've got rid of all of that information. <laughs> and my question is, I guess, how do we actually get beyond that? We've seen some wonderful representations here and yet scientists want to just draw exploded um, pie graphs or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm Tanya. I just, a year and a half ago, I started working as a statistician. Before that, I was a PhD student, and before that, a master student. Um, in all those years, I did psychometrics, and psychometrics is, an important part of it is communicating what you have to the psychologists, showing that what you have is indeed something they can work with. But in all those years of my PhD, I only met a few people who actually looked into the graphs. I never got a course on it. Nobody ever enticed me to start doing something with the data else than the graphs we already all knew. Even worse, halfway through, I told my supervisor I wanted to get to learn GTplot. 
which is a graphics package in R, and he told me that it was way too complicated and not necessary. Um, right now, I work with ggplot every day, and I create new graphs, but I think it would be important and necessary to start with that earlier on. We're starting to learn st students to not just trust anything SPSS say, but actually work with it. And I think we also should give more intention, more work to learning students, PhD students, and new people in the field to, learn, to work with the graphics and the possibilities we have. The nice thing about data visualization is it lets me bring in my hobby, which is art. Now, um, well, in, as artists, we have a large range of sort of techniques, uh, sort of you know, that have been developed over hundreds of years. And I was especially interested in the sort of the new, the the first, the first paper on the sort of the virtual reality thing. Um, so the thought I had was that I was sort of recently looking at sort of doing landscape paintings, and in in terms of landscape paintings, there's a wide range of techniques to emphasize the idea of depth. Okay, so, 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 so how do you make it so that, so that mountains in the distance look like they are in the distance even though you are looking at a two-dimensional image? Now, um, there's, there's, there's a wide range of techniques. There's, you know, um, things like the saturation of an image it, that puts images further away. There's overlapping ob objects in front of them which would which show the depths. There's, there's, there's more sort of subtle techniques like using landmarks that are repeated in an image, so you have one that's close by and then there's one that's you know, much smaller and you will look at it and perceive that it's much further away. Now, um, this is a, quite a rambly introduction to, to, to the idea that I wonder with, this, with these sort of three-dimensional, sort of, with these sort of virtual reality techniques, you are adding on sort of a new, a new sort of method of, of sort of sort of communicating depths to, to, to the viewer. I mean, that's the sort of the, 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 the sort of thing. Now, um, on one part, it sort of suggests to me that, that if we are talking about sort of the sort of depths as of the image, then sort of, then, then sort of the, the artistic sort of ideas could be sort of also another source of communicating this sort of depth. Um, but the, other, the concern I have is that, um, is that potentially, once you invoke the idea of depth in the image, you might create a confusing impression in that your, your stereoscopic vision might be telling you that this thing is, is sort of further away and, and you're communicating that, you know, that there is a three-dimensional three-dimensionality to this image. But at the same time, the, the, the the information that you're getting from the rest of the image, so for example, from, from shading, for example, if you had shading in the image as well, that could create a confusing idea in the viewer. And, and so, so, so my sort of concern is sort of, is sort of how, sort of whether or not sort of these different aspects can, can work together. Because, I mean, we have all remember our advice from, from very sort of starting sort of starting statistics that we should avoid three-dimensional graphs at all costs. <laughs> so, 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 so I, I think that, you know, that's quite a promising thing, but so I have sort of both good, sort of positive feelings and more iffy feelings. I teach criminal investigation, and one of the key things um, to communicate to anyone is that we live as human beings by narrative. That is, we're constantly telling a story. The visualizations that we've seen today, um, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's remember that the story that we have to tell is 10,000 words. The visualizations must always be in context. What's the beginning? What does this show? Where does it lead us? If we don't tell our story, then people tell a story for us. It's our job to tell the complete story, and visualization is actually only a small part of that. Thank you. I enjoyed the papers ex uh, quite a lot, and I valued all the con contributions and responses, but they were all based in qualitative terms. Some spoke of the art world, some spoke of graphic design. What I would have liked to have seen is one, can we actually, uh, reproduce the utility of an image in some sort of number? Is there some sort of scale we can use here? And secondly, 
An image is useless if it's not interpreted by the audience. I would have liked to have seen some, some sort of audience assessment of how good a given image is. And that's it. Can't miss the opportunity at least to say thank you to those of you who've read the paper, thought carefully, and made very constructive comments. That was really very valuable. Um, what are we seeking to communicate? What's the question? Were Peter's, were Peter's points? I fully agree. Forgive me if uh, the pressures of time meant that some of the context of what was being talked about was subsumed. Look at the paper, there's a little bit more detail there. And a very pertinent question, uh, which has been echoed by a number of contributors, Mark's question, are these methods really effective? Well, I once gave a talk, and at the end, a very senior and uh, eminent member of a statistic profession said to me, I didn't understand a single one of the plots that you showed. So that was encouraging. And <laughs> it is an issue of psychological perception, which does need, and there's a huge literature on that, and we should be aware of it, and sadly, I am not. However, I think our esteemed president might, in fact, be working along those very lines. So I'll leave him to take over. Thank you. Clearly... It's, it's been a, you know, you know, I see a lot of contribution, a lot of opinions, and I'm sure we'll see more as uh, we will read all the uh, contributions, uh, the written contribution. Um, <clears throat> maybe the only thing I wanted to say is briefly touch upon what Alessandra said. Um, the use of, of, of virtual reality and, and 3D goes clearly beyond the use of temperature data or wind data. The interesting stuff happens when you have data which are not just uniform fields. For example, when you have uh, precipitation data or volcanic eruptions, for example, and, 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 and those, those kind of, of features can be um, you know, very effective when you use this kind of virtual reality tools. We had another video which I won't show now, but you can, you can, you can see online where we can see another, po another you know, at that time postdoc at, at Kaos where he was showing the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991 and it was, it was really, really impressive. You could see the plume of dust going around the, the, the earth. The point is that as long as you have uniform, uniform fields like temperature, things are not so exciting. The moment you have things which are clearly you know, of high values and zero somewhere else, clearly you can appreciate the value of the third dimension and of exploring the physical space in virtual reality much better. And I'm done.